Analog versus digital. Is there a difference? Well, of course there's a difference in the way they're generated. But can we hear the difference? And even if so, does it matter? And in this video, we're going to dive in deep and geek. Hi guys, and welcome to Geek Talk, where we talk deep and geek about all things related to pianos, keyboards, synthesizers, and music production. And in this video, the first video, it's all about analog versus digital. The subject of analog versus digital is a huge subject which is debated and spoken about in forums since the beginning of time. Well, since the beginning of digital, really. And in this video, we're going to sort of scratch the surface, very much like in my Piano and Keyboard Artist series. We're going to talk about analog versus digital in a very general kind of way. And at the end of this video, I'm going to invite you to leave your comments uh, for elaborations for future videos. The goal of this video is not to discuss how analog and digital are generated and those differences between them. We can certainly address that in another video. The goal of this video really is to discuss as producers, you know, whether you're an experienced producer or an up and coming producer, how the digital has changed the way we work and the differences between, you know, do they sound different and can you hear the difference? And there are different schools of thought with regard to that. Now, I've personally been around long enough to say what I'm about to say with a certain degree of certainty. And that is, I've always noticed that the producers or the musicians or people in the industry like you and myself, if you're a producer, those guys, girls, producers that tend to agonize about details, you know, and I'm one of them. You do get these producers who will spend a week tweaking a hi-hat or a snare drum or a kick drum or, and, and get really bogged down on, on intricate details between analog versus digital, you know, all the technical, all the technical stuff. I always find these very often are the, are the producers who don't have as much success, not always, but it's very interesting when you talk to some of the guys who've, you know, really done well and, you know, what do I mean by doing well? Well, you, uh, that is up to your interpretation. Those that have done well are usually quite laid back about the subjects. And to illustrate this point, I'd like to mention our good friend Gary Newman, who we talk a lot about on this channel. He was asked in an interview something about analog versus digital. And of course, I'm going to paraphrase the way he said it. But Gary Newman fundamentally said, you know, whenever people get into these debates about analog and digital, he said something along the lines of, if that is your biggest concern, then you shouldn't be a musician or something like that. What Gary Newman was trying to illustrate was, and he said it very well, he said, your job or your role as a musician or producer is to make the best record you can and to generate the most, uh, you know, the best listening experience and the best sound that you can generate. And he went on to say that once you get wrapped up on the technicalities of analog versus digital and you kind of lose focus of what the end result is. And that is very, very true. I've seen this so many times and I myself, and I'm sure you have as well, if you're a producer, we, we suffer from this shiny toy syndrome where you get bogged down on things that don't really matter. And something we're going to talk about later also with it on this channel about the psychology of music production is the how, it, how it's very important to never sort of lose focus of the big picture. It is very counterintuitive to sort of start and focus and get intense about little things because we have to understand how people listen to music and that is as a whole picture. And so it is very, I found in my experience, and is, is, is to really start off with the big picture and then work backwards. But that's a subject for another video. So Gary Newman was absolutely right in what he said there and he explained it very well. Now, I'm going to take you back to 1999. This was, what was that, 20 years ago? I had just come to the UK and I got my first job in a music retail store called Turnkey Soho Soundhouse in Charing Cross Road. <laughs> that was an interesting time. Wow. Um, quite turbulent times to which I could dedicate a video separately. But this was the time that I first heard the word plug-in. So the first time I heard the word plug-in was from a man called Robin Vincent. 
And Robin Vincent was our product specialist at Turnkey. Um, we used to call him Rob V. Uh, really, really good guy. Um, he's still around in the industry and doing some great things. And um, I'm going to interview him later on in the year on this channel. So in those days when I worked as a salesman, Rob V used to be our product specialist. And he used to very often before we would start sales for the day, we would have like a like a meetup and he would very often do training and he would describe music technology and and in hindsight I wish I'd paid more attention at the time because at the time I was not interested in computers you know I was known as the keyboards guy and I was just all this stuff in the box just was to me was crap it didn't make sense anyway fast forward to the present day it's so different but Rob V was the product specialist and he used to give us training and he was the first person who mentioned the word plug-in and when I heard that when I first heard the word plug-in I was like you oh, know what what does that mean and I didn't even care at the time but it's interesting if you look at sort of when plugins started you know I mean plugins and music technology or digital music t technology was really sort of in its infancy and this was a time where we saw them creating emulations of popular hardware modular synthesizers um, compressors and all things like that but the interesting thing was back then they couldn't quite get it right because the technology was in an in its infancy and I remember very the very first time I heard the emulation or plug-in emulation of a 909 drum machine I remember listening to it and going okay yeah it resembles a 909 but it's not it's not the same thing and there were many examples of that that I could use but of course fast forward to the present date now is a great time for the music producer and unlike in the sort of 80s and the 70s and back then when when the technology was so expensive that you could you could actually only afford to get into it if you sold one of your kidneys on eBay or if you know if you knew someone or if you had the money. So the great thing about these days is because anyone who really wants to get into it can technically afford it. You know, it's 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 just a lot more achievable these days. So plugins have come a long way. Um, and what's also very interesting is when plugins first came in and you know digital, we had purists like the the genius Vince Clark. I remember reading an article in an interview with uh, Vince Clark, who is the genius of all things analog. And at the time, and this was many years ago, he talked about um, how he doesn't like digital, he only uses analog. I cannot disagree with anything that Vince Clark says about anything about music production. But interesting, I saw a documentary as well um, from the making of their 2007 album, The Light at the End of the World. This was the Erasure album. And it was interesting um, when they produced that album. Uh, Vince Clark and Andy Bell rented a, a little cottage in Portland and Maine and they and interesting seeing them sitting in this little cottage and pretty much working in the way that a, a modern sort of home recording studio would work you know a, a, you know a, a laptop an Apple laptop um, and you know a little controller keyboard and and obviously lots of plugins so I don't know how much of that record was done using digital and this showed that by that time, this was 2007, which was 12 years ago, that even at that point, digital emulations and, and, and plugins had gotten to a point where, you know, they were probably, well, they were good enough for Vince Clark to want to use. In the early days, of course, there were computer crashes. And I remember when I used to work in Turnkey, a lot of the producers I used to talk to at the time, I clearly remember one producer telling me, he said, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, our biggest challenge in the studio was performance and you know artistry and, and getting artists to perform and to, the sort of fundamentals of making the record so far as musicians and composition were concerned but he talked about that in the recent days and this was back in about 2001 he talked about most of the problems in studios nowadays are trying to figure out glitches and computer crashes and errors so there are different challenges these days but Music technology now and the, and, and the software and the synthesizer, you know, the, the, the plug is the emulations. Things are generally a lot more stable than they were. And, and that's what I say. If you're getting into it now, <laughs> you don't know how easy it is compared to the way it used to be. Um, you know, your, your, your starting point as, as, as a producer now, if you just look at simple programs like GarageBand, just, you know, just the basic presets that are in there are world class compared to what we had sort of like in the in the 90s. Now all this talk about analog and digital, it just makes my train of thought run back to the time when it was the late 80s and we all couldn't wait to get rid of our vinyl collections and to replace them with CDs, you know, compact discs. And, and that was, <laughs> in hindsight, it was a stupid thing to do because I knew a lot of people who had 
vinyl collections that they'd had for a long time and they got rid of everything to replace it with CDs and this you know because CDs were the next best thing you know they couldn't scratch it was the ultimate the ultimate way to hear music it was you know it was crystal clear and now it's funny that the resurgence with the resurgence of vinyl we're sort of going back to basics and that is a video I want to delve into separately um, and but just 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 to sort of talk briefly about the difference between analog and digital so far as vinyl goes this is a huge subject guys but uh, there are different schools of thought and there are people and schools of thoughts that have gone on to say that they have proven scientifically that there is no sort of discernible difference when played back on the same equipment and also some schools of thought go on to say that our, our brains and our ears are not adequate, adequately equipped to sort of hear the difference between the two mediums that's a very very interesting topic of discussion right there what I personally believe is when people say that vinyl sounds so much better than CD or digital I think a lot of that is down to the mastering process and of course as we know vinyl has a uh, has a limitation to what we can do with it obviously you know obviously the louder louder it is um, and the more bass will affect you know the groove and the cut and everything and I don't want to go too deeply into that is but with digital you don't actually have the physical limitations that you do with vinyl so digital allowed us to really make our songs longer and also push the volume a lot louder which was in my opinion the worst thing and, I, and I'm going to do a separate video on that where I'm going to address the loudness wars and with this ability to push our music loud there became this loudness wars where you know CDs became louder and louder and louder meaning compression and co more compression came in and compression really is just when you uh, reduce the dynamic range between the highs and the lows that just really meant that recordings were now super duper loud but had no dynamics and what's interesting is if you take a recording let's let's just say do, do this experiment for yourself if you can get a CD from or let's say sort of like from 96 to about 2003 when the loudness wars really went out of hand get a, get a CD from that period and then get a vinyl from the same period in, import the two songs into your system and notice how much louder the CD is obviously but once you volume adjust them back to the same level yeah play them back and ensure that at the same level and, and, and you could use an LUFS meter for this so when these two are now technically playing back at the same level you will notice that the vinyl will probably sound louder and that's because it's more dynamic and that is definitely a separate video we can go into is you know about the loudness wars but I just wanted to use that as an example because it is a a good example between analog and digital and as I say with a lot of studies now showing that there is no sort of discernible difference I think a lot of the leaning towards uh, analog is is a lot to do with nostalgia and of course there are those people who say they can hear the difference and I will just stop right there that's a long subject so obviously if we look at the inception of synthesizers how they came into the industry they were all analog obviously um, because that was the technology of the time and I now want to also discuss some pros and cons between digital and analog just at the top of my head I suppose digital is I suppose you could say more environmentally friendly you know because we're not using physical wood and plastic and physical matter from the universe to make these things digital is a lot more flexible it's a lot more forgiving it's more predictable it's more stable but the byproduct of all that is a negativity to digital and one of the negativities we have with digital is is our almost limitless ability you know if we look back at the beginning of synthesizers uh, I, I remember having friends who used to work with analog synthesizers you know you could not the earlier ones you know you couldn't save the sound you know it was if you take like an SH-101 did you know that the SH-101 was used to make the sound of R2-D2 R2 stop that uh, um, three. So these analog synthesizers were their sliders and faders. Once you'd set it, it wasn't like a digital synth where you could switch it off, switch it on again, and then just recall a preset because the analog synth was the you know, the way the the sliders and the faders were set would determine the sound you'd you'd get. And a way around that at the time, producers used to use Polaroid cameras, and what they'd do is they'd you know tweak you know found the sound they wanted and then take a photo 
off the actual keyboard and then they could refer back to the Polaroid uh, photo at the end, you know, to get the same sound. And that was one of the benefits of analog was the the randomness and it was very temperamental and especially as analog synthesizers get older they become more temperamental you know oscillators go out of tune and it is for this reason that classic analog synths aren't sort of taken onto the stage uh, anymore for live performances and that's not only because they're very valuable but it's also just because of their unpredictability and certainly one thing you do need in a live performance situation is something that is reliable and is going to behave predictably and the randomness of analog gear was something that I miss now and that is because with all the analog came this madness and I always describe this is a strange way to describe it but to me an analog synthesizer is a little bit like have you ever seen that movie Vicky Cristina Barcelona with Penelope Cruz oh my glasses are getting steamed up hmm. yeah where were we um, Penelope Cruz yeah got my glasses steamed up um, yeah, so Penelope Cruz on this movie, Vicky Cristina Barcelona, if you watch that, her name was Maria, Maria Helena, and she was this really gorgeous, temperamental, beautiful woman. And she reminded me of an analog synthesizer, because, God, how geeky do I sound? Imagine going onto a, a, a date and going, so baby, what knobs do you like to twiddle and tweak? <laughs> Sorry guys, that was creepy, but <laughs> Maria Helena or Penelope Cruz on Vicky Cristina Barcelona was this beautiful woman, but she was a, a, a bit like Pandora's box because you could open her up and, and you never knew what you were going to get. And an analog synthesizer was very much like that. You could turn them on, tweak your sound, and then go on to hit record and print, and then the thing, the oscillator would go out of tune and, would do, and you'd be like, no! You know, it was so frustrating, but at the same time it was so free and alive and you know analog synthesizers to me the older ones were like a they're like a force of nature because they were so unpredictable and you never knew what you were going to get and in, indeed a lot of producers will tell you that a lot of magic in the studio happens when things go wrong you know things just go wrong and you went um that's not what i planned but i'll have that so looking back at digital synthesizers now or plugins and emulations of those we don't seem to get that randomness and a, a, a lot a lot of them these days have started to build that randomness into the coding to which a lot of people still feel it's not the same thing and you know will it get better it obviously will and even when we get to a point where it's as good as it can get which i believe we're close to or we might be there already or we're not um there will still be those going no 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 it's got to be analog it's got to be analog interesting when we look at the analog synthesizers where they're you know they're knobs faders and sliders and then we go to the sort of digital synths like the, I'm thinking of the Yamaha DX7 and sort of from that point, sort of from the time where the Yamaha DX7 came right up until sort of like the mid 90s, that period of digital keyboards they really went for this kind of spartan, very plain, very sort of like streamlined look and thereby taking all the knobs and faders away which meant you had a instrument which had very few buttons which was quite modern looking and visually pleasing but they were a nightmare to use because you know to get into a function it was shift you know, shift and shift, hold this, hold that, and and what also was very difficult was a lot of the early Japanese synthesizers, like the you know the Rolands and the and the uh, and the and the Yamahas, brilliant, brilliant keyboards, um, and, and 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 indeed these companies still make brilliant keyboards. But at the time, I remember those those manuals were so complicated because you had to be like a rocket scientist or, a, or an astrophysicist just to use just to read the manual because the manuals were translated directly from from Japanese into English and so a lot of the, the, the you know the tenses didn't translate well from Japanese to English and, and and therefore as a result they were very difficult to use in those days of the old uh, sort of like the mid 80s to the mid 90s keyboards and then sort of when we got to like the late 90s sort of like the up until current times it was very popular to sort of you know bring the knobs and the faders and make keyboards more hands-on again as they used to be and it was around about this time of the sort of late late 90s when they incorporated the best of both worlds where you had the analog synth but it had digital control and the great thing about that is you had the analog circuitry you know if you if which a lot of people wanted but you had the stability and the predictability of digital control so you could technically create your your sound but you could save it and you know recall it as a preset but at the same time 
it's analog and not digital and that was very very appealing to a lot of people and one of the synthesizers that just jumps to my mind now was the Alesis Andromeda and I remember the first time I saw that was when I was working in, in, in Turnkey as the keyboards guy and I think that must have come out around about 2000 or 2001 and that was a mind-blowing synth and it, it still is and if you've got one of those I'd, I'd love to hear from you it's an absolute killer that one so fast forwarding to the present day, there are manufacturers who now make great analog synthesizers but have digital control. And that is really the best of both worlds. With digital, the sky really is the limit. And um, there are many uh, software manufacturers that have created incredible emulations of you know, hardware synths, compressors, you name it. And it intrigues me how they do it. I, I just think that the brains and the and the, the skill behind this are incredible. And you know, we got to take our hats off to these to these manufacturers um, and the, you know and and, and the, the guys who work for them, the brains behind them, the tools they you know the tools we have now. You must remember, guys, that you've got more processing power in your mobile phone than they had in Abbey Road Studios when they recorded the Beatles albums. It's just phenomenal what you've got available today. And coming back to noise floor, you know we. Back in the back in the analog days, you had to record, as I say, at a certain level just to hide that the hissing sound, you know, the, 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 the and the hums. Um, but then also coming to current days, we have now got emulations of tape machines, and you know, to bring that hum and hiss and and to give, bring those flaws back into our music, because it seems there is something about us as humans, whether it be nostalgia or our psyches, where we kind of like those imperfections and everything we kind of strived for in the compact disc we've kind of gone against you know in our wanting to go back to vinyl so the analog digital debate will go on um it, you know th there are still those that will always say they can hear the difference and i sometimes think i can but i don't know if it's psychological and looking at all the evidence where there have been tests and stuff done and guys as i say later on i'd love to do like a big hangout with in the series where we'll hire like a conference room and we'll conference hall, you know, have a few beers and we'll get some analog synthesizers and plugins and we will all be really geeky and we'll we'll do a vote on this. But and there are people that have done this, you know, with blindfold tests where they they'll have an analog synthesizer and they'll have a digital synthesizer or with plugins and they'll blindfold each other and it'll be A, B and it's fascinating to see that most of the time it's just flipping a coin, you know. And also, as I say, at the at the end of the day, when the end result is a good record, shouldn't we just be focusing on the end result? And because remember, when you listen to music, or generally most people, you know, the general public, when they listen to music, the first thing they'll do is they either like it or they don't. They, they don't really care how you've made it. And although in the series, and you the fellow geek, we're going to really talk geeky about things, I think it's very important as a producer to know where to draw the line and not to get hung up so much on the technicalities of making a record that it stops us from getting the work done because one of the drawbacks of digital and something we're going to discuss and address in the channel is the this terrible option of choice and it's interesting because what was that saying necessity is the mother of invention limitations are sometimes sometimes the mother of invention as i say if you're a younger producer who's just come into it now you do not know the struggle that you know it was you know 10 tw 20 years ago and of course indeed i wasn't around when records were made in the 60s and in the 70s but I, and those were real struggles so you've got to remember that this is a great time to be doing and producing music but just as we had to address our limitations back in the old days, these days our biggest problem is the abundance of technology we have. And, and I've almost found that when I do records now or when I work with someone, well, you almost have to limit yourself and go, okay, I'm going to just use this, this, this and that. And that's it. It's, it's like when I made my first record back in 1996 or 1997, I used a Kawaii K4. I used a Roland JV1080, uh, a Roland U20, and yeah, and a and a Roland E16 intelligence synthesizer, and I used a MC50 Mark II micro composer to sequence it all. You know, this was back in the days before the internet, and you know, and I I made that album, and, I, and I'm very proud of it. And 
and I did the best I could with the tools I had. The problem we've got these days is you've, you've, you've got so much choice, it leads to procrastination. And, and what, what is that saying, guys? Is that choice leads to confusion, confusion leads to procrastination, and procrastination leads to paralysis. I think I got it right, but you, you, you get the gist. It's just that we've got too much choice these days and we really need to limit ourselves. Right guys, so I think we will leave it there for this first episode of Geek Talk. And as always, I'd like you to leave your comments and uh, jump in. Let me know what do you think of analog versus digital? Can you hear the difference? Anything you want to say on the subject? And also, let me know what you want us to elaborate on within future videos. Guys, as always, if you're a regular subscriber, I want to thank you for your support. And indeed, if you're new to this channel, please do leave a comment, you know, hit the subscribe button and uh, introduce yourself and feel free to jump in. Guys, I've now, uh, by popular demand, I've set up a Facebook page. And the reason for that is a lot of you have been asking for like a, like a forum or a, like a, 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 like a page where we, you can go to and, and discuss the topics in this video. And I just figured it was probably easiest just to do a Facebook page because, you know, most people are on Facebook. So um, I'll leave links to that below. So there is a Facebook page, but I've also set up a Facebook group. And the Facebook group is private, so you will just need to request a um, request to join. And once you jump into that group, we will be able to discuss everything every every week regarding all the videos. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this. As I say, this was the first video. Thank you so much for your support. And I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. All the best.